welcome everyone it's very nice to see uh, almost 200 participants already and i hope uh, this will be a new useful session to you and i'll give you practical information at the end of it during our discussion as well so please uh, enter your questions in the question and answer box so it's easier for the moderator to see them and we will also have uh, small quizzes on the way just to keep you engaged nothing serious but just so that you focus as uh, Helen pointed out, these are the main areas we will be discussing and uh, it has already been covered, so I'll move on on that. So we are all familiar with the role of the skin for all of us and for babies as well, the role of the skin is of crucial importance. It's the first line of defense against the external environment. So it's part of our innate immunity. In addition, it's maintaining the internal hydration and electrolyte balance, which is very important in a premature baby as we will remember about the insensible water loss that these babies go through and it protects thermal regulation and it serves as a tactile sensory organ so you know about the importance of touch for bonding with the mother the importance of skin to skin care and it also protects penetration of external irritants which may include even water and various chemicals microbes it protects against fluctuation in temperature to some extent and electric and uv rays as well to some extent there is a significant difference between the infant and the adult skin and uh, these are some of the differences as you know these differences are exaggerated in the premature baby more than in the term baby and in all newborns the skin continues to mature over the first one to two weeks and uh, that happens faster in the premature babies uh, who are kept in a lower humidity environment if you keep them in the higher humidity it takes a little longer for the skin cornification the stratum corneum and the epidermis, uh, epidermis are thinner, uh, which means the skin barrier is less mature. The skin cells are smaller, which is making it more permeable. And the natural moisturizing factor, which is part of the skin, is less and it's prone to dryness. So we may need to use emollients in the premature babies, uh, even to maintain the normal texture of the skin. Uh, the skin hydration is greater and this doesn't mean it's less prone actually because of the thinner barrier, there is more proneness to dryness and uh, the skin elasticity is still under development. This plays a very important role in the premature babies when it comes to medical adhesive use because when the elasticity is less and you peel off the adhesives, it may peel off the skin layers as well. The body surface area to weight ratio is greater in the newborn and this means you have a greater potential for absorption. It also makes an important difference in terms of temperature regulation. We know that the immune system is still developing. So the balance of the T helper one, T helper two cells is still evolving. And any uh, exposure to different allergens in this stage may tilt the balance. So the skin barrier is important to prevent the allergens coming in contact with the immune development cells. So if the barrier is interrupted, you have a greater potential for both irritation, infection, and switching of the T helper 1, T helper 2 balance, which we will discuss when we discuss atopic dermatitis. The skin also works as an immunological barrier, and this is what I referred in the earlier uh, part when I mentioned that the entry of allergens to the skin is prevented by having an intact barrier. In atopic dermatitis, for example, you may have a poor barrier and the allergens can enter the skin. You have the uh, Langerhans cells, which are uh, uh, the cells to pro pro provoke immunity when they come in contact with these allergens, the balance may tilt for the helper cells. There is, however, a normal balance despite being exposed to numerous microorganisms. The body, the skin can discriminate between the beneficial and pathogenic bacteria due to your innate memory in these uh, memory cells, the immune cells. There is a very important role to play for the skin microbiome. All of us are familiar with the gut microbiome. We all read about colic, uh, the probiotics, the role of probiotics in different health systems. But it's not only the gut microbiome that is important, it's the skin microbiome as well. And just as in the gut, there is a good balance between the uh, microbiome and our body function. A balanced microbiome uh, is caused by a habitat of billions of beneficial bacteria. And there should be a balance between this and the harmful bacteria. When the beneficial bacteria are more, the harmful bacteria are kept in control. And when the beneficial bacteria are interrupted due to various reasons, 
the harmful bacteria may cause infection. And uh, this balance of the microbiome has a role to play in some diseases, as we will discuss in the next slide. The pH balance is very important. We know that even in the gut, the role of uh, bifidobacteria in maintaining the acidic pH, which favors a healthy uh, gut microbiome. We know the role of uh, gut microbiota in premature babies with NEZ. And similarly, the skin microbiome prefers a relatively acidic environment. And when we say acidic, the pH is around 5. This inhibits the growth of pathogens as well as provo promotes the growth of healthy bacteria. So the bacterial diversity, the nature of the bacteria differs by body zone. Uh, we have individual differences in the way the microbiome is organized in our body. So all of us would know there is a smell, uh, the body odor differs between us. There are uh, different uh, predispositions to uh, color, coloring of your inner garments, for example. All these are created by the differences in your bacteria. And you all know the difference in odor that happens when you take antibiotics. This is nothing but a change in the balance of these bacteria. So the differences in the skin temperature, texture, thickness, humidity, chemistry, they all help to determine what kinds of microbes. And as I was pointing out, our day-to-day -day occurrences like travel, excessive dryness of the skin in the winter, um, taking antibiotics, taking probiotics, all these may influence what bacteria colonize you. So uh, there are conditions like acne, rosacea, atopic dermatitis, which are linked to an unbalanced microbiome. When the balance is lost, you have a higher risk of pathogens like Staphylococcus aureus getting hold and the disease tends to be more severe. The diversity and richness of the skin microbiome are decreased in patients with atopic dermatitis. This has been shown in multiple studies. And as we will see later, there is a very important role of emollients used on a regular basis to prevent dryness which improves the diversity and very important to also use the cleansers of the right pH so that the skin pH is maintained because the right pH of the skin is important to keep the right bacteria on your skin. So improving the microbiome diversity may improve severity of atopic dermatitis as well. So what are the factors that can affect the nature of this infant skin microbiome? We discussed in brief about the various factors in adults as well. So in the newborn, we, of course, the method of birth plays a very important role. And then your routine, skincare routines, how much the mother holds the baby skin to skin, was any antibiotic used in the newborn period? How often do you bathe the baby? And do you have any skincare routine like using emollients? And as I mentioned, the maternal and family contact microbiome plays a role. If baby is in a hospital environment, as you're familiar, the colonization happens with hospital organisms. And unfortunately, in a premature baby, for example, the coagulase negative staphylococcus can cause even septicemia. And the environmental factors in the place you live affects it, as well as other factors like your diet. So uh, there is a significant relationship between the skin microbiota of the mother and the baby. And of course, it depends on the mode of delivery as well as you will see in the next slide. You can see the level of concordance. So the uh, lines reflect the mother and baby and you can see each species, how closely it mimics what is seen in the mother. This is in the early newborn period. And you can see the level of concordance as the baby becomes older. So it's maximum in the first month and then it starts dropping and it lowest level of concordance by nine months. But you can see that uh, after 12 months, it starts rising again and the family factors are similar. So when this baby grows, it reaches a relatively stable microbiome by two to three years. And for adults, it doesn't change much till they reach older age. So it's a fairly um, balanced microbiome, but in newborns, it keeps changing in the early infancy and then it starts stabilizing as they grow older. So the first exposure to microbes happens at the time of delivery and this is called the vaginal seeding which happens right from the time of rupture of membranes. And of course, the type of bacteria on the newborn skin as well as in the gut depends on the delivery mode. So the vaginal uh, organisms colonize the skin when the baby is born by vaginal delivery. So these mimic the vaginal microbiota and the cesarean section delivery, uh, the skin is colonized by uh, mother skin bacteria. The same pattern is seen in the gut microbiota as well. And all of you are familiar with the importance of this and this difference is one of the main reasons why cesarean section babies have a different uh, appetite level. They tend to grow differently and it has long-term health implications as well like obesity and diabetes. So uh, 
the difference in the skin colonization is no longer apparent by one month. The same has been shown for gut microbiota to change by three months. And this continues to change and evolve during infancy and early childhood. And uh, I mentioned in the couple of slides earlier that the skin microbiome is not stable like in adults. It's evolving and this is uh, related to the evolving immune system of the baby and the changing exposure. For example, when the infant starts crawling, they're going to be much more in contact with your environment compared to the more protective uh, access in the early stages of newborn period. And we may need special care to protect this evolving microbiome to channel it in the right direction so we don't get pathogens colonizing the baby as much. So this is a small quiz and uh, the question is about the skin microbiome uh, proliferates, prefers a relatively dash environment. So they have given the answer in the bracket, so it's very easy for you to answer. We'll give you a couple of, uh, maybe a few seconds. Okay, since it's a very easy question, I can stop the poll here. Can we reveal the answer? Abir, I think we can stop the poll. So uh, obviously, a uh, majority of you have answered correctly. So, so surprisingly, some of you have also got it wrong. Uh, remember that acidic pH, anything below seven is acidic, uh, seven is neutral and more than seven is alkaline. And the acidic environment is what is preferred as we discussed earlier. Thank you for participating. So we have uh, a good number participating. Thank you. So a quick mention of uh, some of you may be pediatricians who also do neonatology here. So a quick mention of the role of uh, skin in premature babies specifically. Obviously, the stratum corneum is even thinner in the preterm babies compared to term babies. The cornification happens over the first two weeks. We all know that we have humidification guidelines to help you with the temperature balance because when there is insensible water loss from the skin, which is very thin, evaporation happens. And as we know, evaporation produces cooling. So it makes it very difficult to maintain the temperature of these babies. Uh, when we receive the baby in a plastic bag at delivery, this is to prevent this temperature loss related to the insensible water loss. So the baby's temperature is better maintained. And we keep them in a humidified incubator. But as I said, if you are in a higher humidity, the skin cornification is more delayed. So some units wean the humidity as quickly as feasible by the temperature care allowing you. And uh, I also mentioned the very weak attachment of the epidermis to the underlying layers of the skin, the dermis, by fibrils. So this fibril connection is very thin. Uh, and uh, when we attach medical adhesives, the skin injury happens. And we also know about uh, how uh, we use certain materials like deodorant to prevent this kind of damage. So all units should have a skin monitoring policy as well as skin maintenance protocol. Uh, avoid adhesive things and use only appropriate adhesives which don't peel the skin off. We discussed earlier about the importance of the pH, so I'll not be going into much detail. However, in the newborn, the pH is uh, slightly towards alkaline side and with appropriate skin care uh, and with maintenance, it matures to a pH of 5 and adults have a pH of 4. Uh, ranges up to 6.7, depending on what kind of water hardness and what kind of soap you use, etc. So, of course, there are uh, factors which can affect your skin barrier and uh, the water hardness, the hard water may damage the skin more. Rapid drying of the skin, uh, use of tropical oils like olive oil, which may have a despermitting agent, may be harmful to the skin barrier. And using adult products which are stronger, uh, may also damage. So we have to advise your family as per uh, the appropriate skin care needs. So this is a difference between the healthy skin where you have a balanced microbiome and also an intact skin barrier. So both are interrelated. And this is an example of a dry itchy skin which has a fragile microbiome. The diversity of organisms is far fewer. You have more pathogenic appearing bacteria. And when you have an imbalanced microbiome, you can also see that the barrier is not intact. So it's a balance between the two 
damage to one can damage the other as well. So we have to maintain both. And remember that uh, skin disease doesn't just affect the skin, it affects the entire comfort level of the baby or the child and uh, ultimately the quality of life. So atopic dermatitis, for example, leads to constant itching and scratching. It makes a child more irritable. It affects the time to get the child to sleep. And of course, the skin doesn't look cosmetically appealing. All these factors upset the family as well. So uh, there was a study carried out to see uh, what percentage of the mothers were able to assess whether the baby's skin was dry or well hydrated. 10% of the babies believed their baby's skin was dry, but actually 60% of the babies were found to have clinically visible dry skin. So it's very subjective, very difficult to perceive. And uh, in the Middle East, for example, where we live in an air conditioning environment, the uh, dryness of the skin is almost universal. There are studies which have shown that moisturizing the skin from the early stages can reduce the uh, incidence and severity of eczema including uh, the severity of atopic dermatitis. So it's very important that we educate the parents and uh, using a mild emollient on a regular basis is a good skincare practice. So if you under recognize the dry skin, you may have skin irritation and when the baby scratches, it breaks the barrier more and uh, it affects the microbiome as we discussed. So atopic dermatitis is a fairly common disease and you would see that the highest incidence is in the regions with Caucasian uh, populations and the darker skin races have a less uh, prevalence of the disease, but this also could indicate less identification as we will see further on. So we have uh, overall in the Eastern Mediterranean region, in the younger uh, children's around 3% and in the 13 to 14 year olds at 6.5%. So we have uh, a question from this slide coming up later on. So you can uh, look at this carefully, this figure. And in terms of uh, incidence, it's variable, but this is the cumulative incidence. So this is specific to Saudi Arabia and like any other country, atopic dermatitis is the most common skin disease and 17% of the ER visits in pediatrics are due to skin complaints in babies. Of course, uh, not all uh, rash in the way newborn babies is atopic dermatitis, a mild eczematous skin is very common due to dry skin. But if you have a family history, if it is persistent and you need specific anti-inflammatory treatment, for example, you're more likely to have atopic dermatitis. The other important aspect to remember is that not all atopic dermatitis is related to food allergy. So if it is a mild atopic dermatitis and there is no clear uh, predilections shown to certain foods, you don't need to routinely avoid cow's milk products, for example, or uh, ask the mother to go off milk and egg if she's breastfeeding. So only a small percentage of atopic dermatitis actually has uh, allergy to food products. The more severe ones, you are more likely to try that. And uh, onset of the itchy skin is typically less than two years. However, we can start seeing the rash within the first year of life. Quality of life is impacted uh, and only scabies has a larger impact on the quality of life and compared to other dermatological conditions and only cerebral palsy has a greater impact uh, compared to atopic dermatitis uh, in terms of long-term impact. So it's a lifelong or a serious condition and careful education of the family and advising them on the regular appropriate treatment is very important. So what causes atopic dermatitis? Of course, uh, multifactorial, you do have the genetic predisposition where there may be a mutation in the filaggrin or the related genes, which are important to maintain the skin barrier, the intactness of the epidermis. So skin barrier dysfunction due to various factors, environmental factors have an add-on effect. We advise families to avoid woolen clothing, direct contact with the skin, not to keep the room too humid and uh, microbiome effects are very important. So the different manifestations, the different levels of severity relate to your skin pH maintenance, the different microbiome and immune dysregulation of course happens as a result of the skin barrier dysfunction and the underlying genetic condition where the balance of the T helper one and T helper two is altered to a T helper two predominance. So uh, you can see that all these impact on the management. So very important to focus on these aspects, both in the prevention of the condition and in the treatment. 
Of course, we have a differing phenotype and the underlying uh, immune factors, the uh, polarization levels of the T helper 2. You can see in psoriasis, for example, the T helper 2 activation is absent and T helper 1 predominant. So it's like an immune phenomenon damaging the skin. In atopic dermatitis, because of the skin barrier interruption, your uh, immune uh, function recognition of the foreign antigens is altered. And so the T helper 2 becomes predominant in most of these conditions. The level of epidermal thickness differs. So in the dark skin, as we will see later, the identification may be a little delayed. So the lichenification is more commonly a presentation in the fair skin. The redness is picked up fairly early. So you may start the treatment earlier. So the stratum corneum is a primary barrier against water loss and the skin also includes fatty acids, cholesterol and ceramides. Ceramides are a very important component as we will discuss later in maintaining this uh, barrier. So you have these uh, hydrophilic, lipophilic chains and uh, cholesterol and ceramide uh, form an important barrier here to prevent the entry of different harmful substances. So just a quick quiz again. So what is the overall prevalence of atopic dermatitis in the Eastern Mediterranean region in the older children, 13 to 14 year old? So I did warn you when we came to that slide. So I hope you can answer this. We'll give a few seconds for you to answer the question. So, Abir, can we close the poll and proceed? So, the answer is actually 6.5%. And uh, so, congratulations to those of you who are attentive on that slide. Of course, I mean, any percentage could work according to the region you live in. This is the Eastern Mediterranean region. And of course, um, this is not hard and fast because it depends on the study and how it was done and so on. So, don't worry if you got it wrong. It's not far. So as we mentioned, ceramides can be found in the epidermis and uh, it makes up approximately 50% of the skin lipid composition, the outermost layer, which is the epidermis of the skin. It acts as a bonding agent that holds the skin cells together and these help the skin to maintain the protective layer. The maintenance of this protective layer is important to help act as a barrier against bacteria, environmental pollutants and allergens. So when you have an intact barrier, the allergens find it difficult to enter. And uh, there are many factors which can change as we discussed earlier. So it can happen with the main, not maintenance of the microbiome, change in the pH, reduction in the total ceramide content. So we tell you not to use uh, much of a hot water based bathing regime because hot water uh, and the prolonged bath is not recommended in hot water as well because it removes your skin lipid. Use of uh, excessively strong soaps uh, as used in adult products. Even for adults, we don't recommend strong soaps. So it may remove your ceramide content from the skin, making it more prone to dryness. So uh, this is how you lose the protective effect when the binding agents are lost. And it's possible to chemically recreate the ceramides, which can be added to emollients. And uh, these actually make them cosmetically better to use as well than the oily, greasy preparations. So patients with dry skin have lower ceramide levels and the darker skinned uh, people may have a stronger barrier function, even though uh, the ceramide content was low because this uh, maturation is better in these races. So I discussed this point briefly when we discussed the difference in uh, atopic dermatitis between the different races. So you can see that in a fair skin, the edema is picked up fairly quickly, while in the dark skin, you actually don't see the edema in frequent case. This is already quite an advanced case. As you can see, the skin is thickened already. So it may present as a purple or gray hue. Mainly the itching may be a pointer. So if the child starts rubbing or itching an area, you start moisturizing more. So you don't need to wait for the thickening to happen. Ideally, you should treat before the thickening happens and have a suspicion if the child is scratching, emollients always help. So the scoring systems, which depend on the skin erythema, dramatically underestimate the severity of atopic dermatitis. And in the incident slide, I mentioned that that could be one of the factors why 
its uh, higher incidence in the caucasian races and uh, black children actually have a high uh, incidence of severe atopic dermatitis six times higher risk compared to their white counterparts so this tells you the stages in the disease progression and the different changes that happen so the predisposition stage you already have the risk of impaired skin barrier which uh, exposes you to the genetic and environmental factors which can harm so this is where the allergens enter and the immunological changes may happen then the cytokine reaction happens from the immunological response the each starts the each scratch cycle starts and there is further barrier disruption due to the scratching so the factors which predispose to this we discussed already the loss of lipid layer in the skin reduced filaggrin according to the mutation you have in that patient and when you lose the skin surface there is reduced differentiation of the epidermal cells so uh, different agents which may be used to treat each of these is mentioned i'm not going to go into the detail and when the inflammation changes the immune cells start infiltrating and then you start getting the hyperplasia lichenification which is when the skin becomes thick and dark at this stage it becomes chronic it's fairly difficult to treat and it gets fairly difficult for the family emotionally because it looks odd uh, cosmetically so here we come to the last part which is the management of emollient therapy there are multiple studies and there is this recent study published in 2018 which shows that uh, the regular use of an emollient reduced disease severity flares and the need for topical steroids in children with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis the recent severe respire because then you need further treatment with the anti inflammatory as well in these children and i also mentioned in the beginning about the prevention the aspect of uh, using regular emollients in a child with risk of atopic dermatitis where the risk is reduced by emollients so the emollients can be occlusives or it can be humectants occlusives provide a layer of oil on the surface of the skin this will slow the water loss and increase the moisture content ingredients like uh, petrolatum white soft paraffin waxes oils and silicones can be used so remember that this function works on whatever kind of water vapor content is already on the skin and that is why we always have to stress to the family to apply the emollient on wet skin so don't dry the skin fully after a wash and if you are not bathing the child you can use a wet towel to sponge the child or use a wet wrap before you apply the emollient this works even for the humectants so they are greasy and uh, compared to the oily preparations the creams and lotions contain water and they are more acceptable cosmetically and these are called the humectants so the final quiz is again an easy question ceramides can be found in which layer of the skin so they obviously uh, lead to 50% of the skin's lipid composition so uh, is it in the epidermis dermis or the stratum cornea okay i think uh, we can close the quiz here so obviously the stratum cornea is the topmost layer of the epidermis and uh, the ceramides are in the stratum cornea layer which binds it uh, but don't worry if you got it epidermis epidermis you are right as well because stratum cornea is part of the epidermis so is a trick question so the effects of emollients on the infant skin microbiome has been studied as well so you can see here that without emollients at different stages it's not a significant difference however you see at each stage you have an improvement in the diversity of the microbiome uh, more varied by week 4 in the babies where the emollients was used and as we discussed earlier the more diverse the microbiome population the more protective it is to the skin and moisturizing is a key step in protecting the healthy baby skin and this is because the dry skin may ultimately lead to scratching and barrier damage and uh, we have to protect the baby's delicate skin so it can be uncomfortable it can cause eczema and when the skin barrier breaks down you have a higher risk of infection and also the risk of allergen entering through the skin and the immune system changing so uh, 
We cleanse the skin with gentle products which are of the appropriate pH range, which maintain the skin pH and the microbiome. Avoid using excessively hot water. Don't prolong the bathe time. You don't need to bathe the child every day, uh, but wetting the skin and cleansing is important. And emollient should be uh, applied after the cleansing. And uh, you will be looking at this as well in the next slide. Most of the experts, including the multiple uh, organizations in Europe, uh, the experts recommend the use of liquid cleansers containing emollients and cleansing bars are not recommended in young infants and babies. Appropriately formulated emollients can preserve, protect and enhance the skin barrier by supplying the water and lipids and inhibiting the water loss. And moisturizing the skin accompanied with gentle cleansing. Remember to apply the moisturizer on wet skin. Using a skincare uh, regime containing occlusive skin protectants and it should be free of irritating ingredients. Uh, this will help to protect and keep the skin hydrated well. So emollients restore the barrier and soothe the dry eczema prone skin. And the NICE guidelines in UK recommends regular use of emollients for children and adults. The cold environments, I mean, UK is a cold country and here it is no different. I mean, you should uh, see to believe how the temperatures indoor are kept at 16 to 18 degrees in most of the places which are air conditioned. Emollients are a key treatment for the relief of eczema prone skin and it's very simple, safe and effective. It should be the first line treatment for patients with atopic eczema and because our aim is to avoid the use of steroids, we have to choose the right emollient. We have to teach the family how to use emollient properly and I know it's relatively expensive in some places according to the products you choose. So we have to uh, show them how to use it on a regular basis and Regular uh, maintenance is actually cheaper than treating it aggressively because you need more of the emollient to aggressively treat and you need to apply it more frequently once the skin uh, loses its normal texture. And uh, intensive treatment can reduce the need for topical steroids. So this is the occlusives where we mentioned uh, that they have a greasy feel while the humectants are uh, better tolerated because they are water-based and uh, they also include ingredients which uh, can get into the stratum corneum, function similar to the ceramides. So glycerin, propylene glycol, sorbitol, urea, these are products which can be added to make it more effective. And most of them are combination of uh, a little bit of oily preparation, but the proportion of water content varies. Lotions are much easier to spread. And so for regular maintenance, lotions are easier. They're also relatively cheaper. Uh, so, I mean, when you ask the parents to maintain the skin, lotions are easier, but if there is eczema, creams are better products. And in both cases, you have to apply it on wet skin. So, there is a significant advance and colloidal oatmeal formulations have been shown to be significant improvements uh, related to other products in the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Of course, there are many different claims from many different companies. So it's not that only one product will work. And this is one of the products which may work. And it has been shown in studies to have an anti-inflammatory effect, helps to repair the barrier and also maintains a moisturizing property. So the study has assessed these severities uh, and shown to be better. So this study also showed the 1% colloidal oat eczema cream significantly improved all these aspects by day 14. And the standard moisturizer improved hydration, but the anti-inflammatory property was at as prominent. So it has been clinically shown what based uh, skincare products to reduce the severity of eczema while maintaining the overall quality of life. And multiple studies have evaluated this. And uh, one of the concerns when we have uh, products like oats, which are food products, whether there is allergenicity, this has been shown in multiple extensive studies that no allergies were reported in as much as close to 4.500,000 customers. And it has multiple uh, product, I mean, components which help. So polysaccharides, which help with the barrier replenishment, uh, enzymes, which protect as antioxidants, anti-irritant benefits, lipids, as we said, are a prime component. Vitamin E, saponins are also there. And uh, it drops the pH of the skin almost within a few minutes of starting the treatment. And uh, it maintains it uh, for a few hours, so which is a very important effect as we discussed earlier. So the 
lipid content of the broths which are commonly used to produce oatmeal is 6 to 12 percent again a hint for you uh, you need to focus on this slide more and you can see that the fat distribution is significant with triglycerides forming the most important component so the uh, fat content is 6 to 12 percent Ceramides account for 50% of the stratum corneum lipid mass, and these are essential for barrier function by inhibiting the water loss and preventing potentially harmful substances from entering. So you can see here that using the oatmeal product helps with the ceramide replenishment in the skin. Obviously, maintaining the barrier itself will improve your uh, ceramide content because you don't lose the surface layers. And reduced corticosteroid use is one of the aims of our management and this slide gives you the various effects that we may see with repeated corticosteroid use. Of course, the systemic effects are very distant and we don't see that very commonly in children, but uh, you may have uh, thinning atrophy of the skin, telangiectasia and uh, of course, uh, steroid use is worrying for many parents, so if you avoid the steroids, you'll be happy. So this last part of the quiz. What is the total lipid content of the growths? You have 20 to 25%, 2 to 3%, and 6 to 12%. Okay. Shall we stop with this here, please? Good. Thank you, Abir, for coordinating the quiz efficiently. And uh, so 6 to 12 percent is the right answer. So you can neck and neck with the wrong answer. So uh, thank you for your participation. We can see that the participant numbers are higher as we go on. So very good. So coming to the end of the presentation now. So what are the key points to stress on baby skin care? Water is the basis of all these cleaning uh, procedures, but using just water is not the most effective. And it has also been shown in studies that psychologically it's not satisfying. And uh, according to the hardness of the water, it can dry or irritate the skin as well. And if cleansing products are used, they should be specially formulated for infant skin with appropriate pH levels. They should have been clinically tested. Many store bought vegetable oils like olive oil can break down the skin barrier. Uh, olive oil, as you will see in the next slide, has a despermitting property. It helps you to use it as a predominant agent in seborrheic dermatitis, for example, where the despermitting effect helps you. But in a normal skin, if you use olive oil, it can break the barrier. Mineral oil can be used uh, as an oil for massaging the baby. Of course, oil alone is very weak emollient. And so you use it more for massage where the bonding will help the routine skin care uh, that the baby needs before the bath. And we should also reassure the parents that there are some preservatives that are added to skin products uh, because some of these have a long shelf life and in the absence of it, especially the parents are not particularly uh, good in maintaining the containers closed. For example, they leave it open for some time. So you may have bacteria, mold and fungi and we are applying it on a very sensitive skin of the baby. So some preservatives are normal and that the ones that are used should be the safe ones. So it should have been studied well. And that's why choosing products made by uh, reputed companies is very important. This is uh, about the despermitting property of olive oil, which I already discussed. So what can be the ideal skincare routine and educating the parents on this? So. It's useful to tell them about the good practices in routine. Uh, even before delivery, we can advise them on the benefit of vaginal delivery compared to cesarean, so they don't choose it for any reason. Of course, if it's medically needed, it's a different reason. Breastfeeding is very important to support because it helps your uh, uh, microbiome formation. And uh, skin barrier disruption, uh, the, what can produce this disruption, what can be used to prevent this, all should be educated. We should teach them to avoid soaps and adult skincare products. So the bar soaps better to be avoided at least till two years of age, preferably even longer. And use mild formulations which are meant for babies. It shouldn't be written to the baby's eye, for example, if you're using a 
shampoo. It should be compatible with the naturally developing skin microbiome. It should support the natural skin pH and hair pH. And uh, using the combination of a wash solution with emollients gives you the best protein. Breastfeeding we discussed and regular skin to skin contact. So the bacterial composition is comparable to what the mother has. And of course, very important to teach uh, the mother about the nappy care as well. So we shouldn't be using pressure on the skin. Appropriate use of barriers is important and timely change of the nappy. The way you clean the nappy area from front to back should be educated. So don't assume that the parents know all this. It's a good practice either in your initial uh, review of the baby in the postnatal area or when they come to the clinic to educate them. I'll be sharing the link uh, to my YouTube channel, which is for parenting as well as for uh, neonatal care. So I'll share it in the chat box and you're welcome to review that, which has multiple playlists, including one on skin care. So with this, I'll stop sharing the screen and uh, thank you for your attention. I think uh, Helen will share the questions with us. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, you were talking about uh, oatmeal uh, for treating eczema, right? Uh, so, can we can we can we use it actually to treat uh, eczema on premature babies? I mean, it can be used, but in premature babies, eczema is not very common. I mean, if you mean the eczema in the premature babies after they go home, of course, it can be used. But when they are in the NICU, we don't see eczema specifically, but we see more of the adhesive-related uh, uh, damage to the skin. So the nurses who work in the NICU know very well the importance of uh, maintaining the skin. Of course, I mean, when the baby is in the NICU, I wouldn't use any products which have uh, additional components. Uh, we use simple emollients, but uh, once the baby goes home, what meal-based products can be used if the baby has eczema in the skin. So, so at what age okay, can we start uh, using uh, creams and... Uh... Right. I mean, right from term, it's fine. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, if, we start to, if we started using steroids for baby, can we shift to ceramids? Steroids are anti-inflammatory agents and there are certain guidelines to use them. We should be very clear about what strength of steroid is used. As you know, in babies, we should use the mildest steroid like 1% hydrocortisone. We should be clear about uh, where, how much to use, I mean, the tip of the finger to cover uh, the surface, uh, use the minimum amount needed. And of course, uh, when we are using proper emollients, the duration, even if steroid is indicated, the inflammation level is significant enough you don't need to keep using it as a course for a few days. Once the symptoms come down, you can easily go to ceramide containing products to reduce the duration of steroid use. So you can, by properly moisturizing, you can prevent the need for steroids in the first place. And by continuing to moisturize effectively, you can reduce the strength of the steroid as well as the duration that you need it. So educating is very important so that you don't need the higher steroids. Okay, perfect. Uh, one last question. Uh, is gut um, bacteria a microbiota? Microbiota. I mean, microbiota just indicates the different bacteria that are there. So obviously, whether it is on the skin or whether it is in the gut, when we say microbiome, I mean, we have two different things. Microbiota, which indicates the diverse uh, microbes and all these we are talking of Bacteria, of course, it includes aerobes and anaerobes. Most of these are anaerobic bacteria. You might know that up to 10 to the power of 14 bacteria are there in the gut. It's not as much in the skin, but in certain parts of the skin, like in the genital area or in the axilla, it's quite a high number. And the oral cavity has a good number of microbes as well. So uh, the diverse range is very important. These are all bacteria, of course, not all of them are pathogens. Uh, so I hope this answers your question. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from uh, Shamshad. What's your opinion regarding of mustard oil after giving a bath? It was used in old days. I mean, mustard oil is smelly. I don't know if you have used mustard oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So <laughs> I don't think a parent would like their baby to be smelly. Coconut oil is often used and I mean, we don't see much allergy, but mineral oils, uh, which are relatively inert, uh, not expensive as well, and it doesn't smell. So I mean, mineral oils can be a first choice. Mild fragrances, which are safe to use, which are shown to be non-allergenic can be there in these products as well. But if you just want to use an oil, don't use olive oil. Mustard oil, I'm not sure about the written property, but the smell certainly would put me off.